Hello and welcome back to History for Atheists. Perhaps you've heard a version of this story. Once upon a time... Once upon a time there was a ruthless, cynical and wicked Roman general called Constantine. He took advantage of turmoil in the Roman Empire to defeat his main rival in battle and seize power as Roman Emperor. To do this, he pretended to adopt Christianity and he used the support of the empire's Christians to secure and hold the imperial throne. He made Christianity the state religion and imposed the faith by force, though this was just a cynical move as he remained a pagan and was only baptised on his deathbed. He co-opted Christianity for his own political purposes, calling the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD to turn Jesus into a god and to also select the books that suited his purposes to make up the Christian Bible. So far from being a holy book, the Bible venerated by Christians to this day was actually created by a violent pagan Roman emperor for political reasons. This is a dramatic and rather ironic story and it's one we often find retold in popular culture. It's a key claim in the supposedly historical background to Dan Brown's schlock airport thriller, The Da Vinci Code. And unfortunately, it gets repeated by many prominent atheists, despite the fact that it's complete nonsense. For example, here's podcaster, comedian and atheist Joe Rogan in 2015, giving his learned assessment. Now, well, the New Testament was made by Constantine, who was a fucking Roman emperor who wasn't even Christian. Mm. He didn't even believe it. He was, he was, he was, he was, he became a Christian on his fucking deathbed. Like, that's when he became a Christian. Like, all these people that are, like, really into the New Testament. Mm. And, like, I'll talk about Old Testament shit, and people get mad at me on Twitter. Yeah. They'll send me this fucking hate text. You understand, motherfucker, what the difference is between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because the New Testament is utter horseshit. It's created by a bishop and a fucking emperor. That's a fact. That's like established religious fact. Like everyone knows where it came from. And not only that, it was written hundreds of years after the death of Jesus. So what are you talking about? What are you talking about indeed? Of course, Rogan is a famously idiotic loudmouth who spread misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic, caught the virus himself and then treated himself with horse dewormer. So some could argue it's unfair to hold him up as representative of atheist activists on Constantine and on the origins of the Bible. But the person you can hear making approving noises during Rogan's rant is his guest, Peter Boghossian. Boghossian is a former professor of philosophy at Portland State University a leading light of the new atheist movement and, supposedly, an intellectual. Yet here is his reaction to Rogan's version of history. That was a thing of beauty, by the way. Well, thanks. That was a thing of beauty. And Boghossian is hardly alone in accepting this caricature of history. In 2019, the doyen of new atheism, Richard Dawkins, released Outgrowing God, a kind of atheism primer aimed at teenagers. In it, Dawkins encourages his young readers to abandon myths and analyse things by relying purely on facts. This is admirable advice, but unfortunately Dawkins' grasp of history depends on several, well, myths, including several repeated claims about Constantine. Very early in his book, he tells his audience that belief in God is largely a matter of historical chance. It's a historical accident. The adoption of Christianity as the Roman Empire's official religion by the Emperor Constantine in AD 312 that led to Yahweh's being worshipped around the world today. The idea that Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Empire at any point, let alone as early as 312, is complete nonsense. But this doesn't stop Dawkins from repeating this myth twice more in this fairly short book. And like Rogan, Dawkins is convinced it was Constantine who set the canon of the Christian Bible. The canon was largely fixed in AD 325 by a conference of church leaders called the Council of Nicaea, set up by the Roman Emperor Constantine, the one whose conversion led to Europe becoming Christian. He made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Hawkins likes this claim so much that he repeats it no less than seven times in the book. He also claims that the four Gospels supposedly selected by the Council of Nicaea were chosen from a plethora of alternative Gospels, saying there were about 50 of them. So here we have a leading atheist activist, described in a blurb on the book in question as no less than one of our greatest explainers, 
thinkers and writers, making much the same claim as the ranting lunkhead Joe Rogan. And every single one of these claims is nonsense. Let's begin with Rogan's claim that Constantine wasn't even a Christian and didn't even believe in Christianity because he was only baptised on his deathbed. This is regularly stated as unalloyed fact by new atheists. In God is Not Great, for example, Christopher Hitchens states quite casually that Christianity was eventually adopted for political reasons by the Emperor Constantine. But the idea that Constantine's conversion was some kind of cynical political sham is a common trope largely because it has its origins in Protestant theology. Protestantism has always presented itself as a return to Christianity's true form after a centuries-long detour into theological error by the Catholic and Orthodox traditions. This means that there has to have been a point where Christianity left its original true form behind and went wrong according to this theological position. Constantine provides what seems to be an obvious location for this, whereby a scheming emperor made a worldly offer of political power that the previously pure Christian church could not refuse. This is why Protestants tend to see Constantine as a villain, or Catholics tend not to, and the Orthodox tradition actually venerates him as a hero and even as a saint, giving him the Greek title Isopostolos, or equal to the apostles. So like a lot of new atheist arguments, this one is basically a Protestant attack on Catholicism rebadged. Unfortunately, the idea that Constantine's conversion was a purely political move misunderstands both the nature of conversion and the nature of politics in Constantine's time. Rogan presents the fact that Constantine was only baptised on his deathbed as evidence that he wasn't even a Christian and didn't even believe in Christianity. This is because in modern Christianity, a convert tends to be baptised as one of the first steps in the process of becoming a Christian, and in most traditions, is not considered a Christian at all until they do so. But this wasn't the case in the 4th century. At that stage, baptism was the end goal for a convert, not the first step. First, they had to undergo a long period of complex instruction and initiation before eventually being fully admitted to the congregation. More importantly, baptism wasn't something that assured the convert's salvation and could actually be cancelled out by committing serious sins. Given there was no formalised sacrament of confession at this stage, a convert who sinned badly would be excluded from the church community and refuse the sacraments. It was only after a long process of penance and public repentance that they could take their place among the faithful again. And this onerous process could only be gone through once, after that, the sinner was permanently excluded. All this meant that many converts delayed full baptism for as long as possible, and delaying it until the end of one's life actually became quite common. The second century Christian writer Tertullian strongly advised delaying baptism, ordering that baptism is not rashly to be administered, and declaring, so according to the circumstances and disposition and even age of each individual, the delay of baptism is preferable. Tertullian was arguing mainly against the baptism of babies and children, but cautions like his meant that delay became more and more the norm. It was only with St Augustine's development of the concept of original sin in the 5th century that urgency for the baptism of all potential converts, even infants, became the norm in both theology and in practice. So far from being evidence that Constantine didn't really believe in Christianity, his delay is actually a sign of his sincerity. The delay also made sense for him given the nature of being a Roman emperor in this period. Constantine became emperor after a revival of the previous century's long period of instability and civil war, where emperors rose and fell rapidly and their falls usually involved their death. So he inherited a political tradition that was ruthless and often murderous, kill, or be killed. And he was famous for doing his share of killing, with his victims including his wife Fausta and his eldest son Crispus. So it's small wonder that he delayed baptism to the last possible opportunity as a way of ensuring that he got into heaven. The idea that he adopted Christianity for political reasons, as Hitchens asserts and as Rogan implies, also misunderstands fourth century politics. It seems to make sense to many modern people that adopting Christianity to win the support 
of the empire's Christians and so secure or maintain the imperial throne would be a good if cynical political move. After all, plenty of modern politicians pose as religious believers for precisely this reason. But this is not how things worked in the fourth century. To begin with, popular support was simply not important. Support from the people who mattered, however, was. In this period, this meant first and foremost, support from the army. And secondly, support, or at least acquiescence, from the senatorial and equestrian classes. Constantine had the crucial support of the army. As one of the four sub-emperors under Diocletian, Constantine's father, Constantius Chlorus, had won the loyalty of key army units in the west of the empire by leading them in a succession of victories against Roman usurpers, against the Franks, and against the Alamanni. That devotion was transferred to his son Constantine when he was claimed as Augustus of the West on his father's death in 306 AD. And he secured the Western army's loyalty even further with victorious campaigns in Britain against the Picts and then on the Rhine against the Franks. The late Roman army liked winners and Constantine made sure they were paid regularly and his victories also meant they won cash bonuses called donatives and also had an opportunity for plunder. So well before he made his bid for the emperorship in 310, he had the full loyalty of the large Western forces under his control. After he won the Imperial Purple, he maintained the loyalty of the whole empire's forces throughout his long 31 year reign. This support had nothing to do with any conversion to Christianity. To begin with, he'd secured it years before he converted in 312 AD. More importantly, the army was not substantially Christian. In fact, at this stage, Christians would have formed quite a small minority in the ranks. This is partly because Christianity was still a relatively small sect in the early 4th century. But it's also because Christianity had long been somewhat pacifist, and most Christians had traditionally avoided military service. Early Christian pacifism has often been overstated by some Christian scholars, and there's certainly good evidence of Christian soldiers in the Roman army well before Constantine's time. But this evidence indicates their numbers in Constantine's army would have been quite small. So the idea that he converted to win support from his troops makes absolutely no sense. He already had that support, and those troops cared about victories, regular food, pay and plunder, not what gods their commander did or didn't pray to. Constantine gave them more than enough to secure and maintain their all-important loyalty. After all, emperors who lost that loyalty usually ended up dead pretty quickly. Maintaining the support of the senatorial and equestrian classes, however, was a trickier proposition, though an emperor with a loyal army at his back was usually able to achieve this. These were the aristocratic and educated elite class that formed the backbone of the Roman administration, and they were crucial to any emperor's rule, as they made up the huge bureaucracy that Diocletian had established late in the previous century. Again, far from being impressed by a conversion to Christianity, this caste was overwhelmingly pagan and highly conservative when Constantine came to power. Christianity was, as I just mentioned, still a very small sect in this period. Even the higher estimates have Christians that know more than 10 to 15% of the total population of the empire in 300 AD. And there are good reasons to think the figure could be substantially lower than that. More important than the numbers here, however, is who these Christians were. Christianity had initially propagated itself among the lower classes, plebeians, slaves, and freedmen, mostly in cities and along trade routes. Its opponents regularly satirized it as a faith for the uneducated and the lowly as a result. By the early 4th century, this had changed to some extent, and we have evidence of more wealthy and sophisticated Christians, though largely because most of our evidence comes from those wealthy and sophisticated Christians. But the fact remains that not only was the empire's population of Christians small, but it was also largely socially and politically powerless and unimportant. The elite and the politically significant were overwhelmingly pagan and generally regarded Christianity with a degree of distaste, if not outright contempt and opposition. After all, it was this elite that had carried out Diocletian's persecution of the Christians from 303 AD, which Constantine finally ended in 313. And the upper echelon of this class remained pagans well into the 5th century or even much longer. Clearly, converting to Christianity was hardly going to win support from this class. Quite the opposite, in fact. 
So while the idea of converting to Christianity for political reasons to win and hold power may sound plausible to many modern people, it makes no sense at all once we look at the social, demographic and political situation in the early 4th century. Rather than benefiting him politically, it would actually have been something of a liability. It would be more accurate to say that Constantine became emperor despite becoming a Christian, not because he did so. Rogan and Hitchens are dead wrong. So was his conversion genuine or was he still some kind of pagan? Here things are actually a little bit more complicated. Rogan may have based his belief that it was not genuine or that he didn't convert at all on his misunderstanding of the significance of deathbed baptism in the fourth century. But there is other evidence that often gets invoked to argue that Constantine remained a pagan and either that the Christian sources lied about him becoming a Christian or his conversion was some kind of political sham. After all, Constantine raised a victory arch in Rome in 315 to celebrate the defeat of his rival Maxentius at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge three years earlier. This was the battle he had won because, according to the Christian sources, he'd seen a vision of Jesus, and so his victory was the reason he converted to Christianity. Yet the arch has no reference to Jesus or Christianity in its inscriptions, and no depiction of anything Christian in its iconography. On the contrary, its decoration includes depictions of pagan gods and spirits. His coins also often depicted pagan gods, especially Victoria, the goddess of victory, Roma, the divine personification of Rome, and particularly the sun god Sol Invictus. And there's other evidence that is cited supporting the claim that he remained a pagan. Inscriptions show that he accepted and used the pagan title of Pontifex Maximus, or chief of the ancient college of pontiffs, a high-ranking pagan priestly office which had been held by the emperors since Augustus. He raised a column in his new capital of Constantinople that was topped by a statue of Apollo with his face and was turned towards the rising sun. He gave permission for at least one temple to worship him as a manifestation of the sun god and we have inscriptions to him as a solar deity. So it's often claimed all this simply does not fit with the idea that he converted to Christianity. There were several problems with this line of argument. To begin with, the Roman state was deeply conservative and based on ancient conventions, titles, iconography and ceremonial, many of which were linked to the traditional pagan cults that had been central to the imperial system for over 400 years. These are not things any emperor would suddenly change overnight, particularly not a new emperor, ruling until 324 AD with a pagan co-emperor who had converted to an unpopular minority cult. So it makes sense that many of the traditional titles, imagery and trappings of the emperors would be retained by Constantine, at least initially, even though they were overtly pagan. While Constantine ruled longer than any of his immediate predecessors and maintained a tight grip on power, this was by no means guaranteed when he first seized the emperorship. The previous century had seen emperors rise and fall in rapid succession. And so recent history taught that emperors who gained power by military means generally lost it again soon afterwards, along with their lives. As I just mentioned, Constantine ruled with a co-emperor, Licinius, who was more of a rival than a partner. They fought a war in 314 and then maintained a very uneasy truce for the next 10 years until Licinius' final defeat and execution in 324. So for the first 18 years of his reign, Constantine's hold on the emperorship was far from secure. This meant he was hardly going to impose his religion on the empire by force or by imperial mandate, at least not in the first part of his reign. This combination of Roman conservatism and Constantine's need for a degree of diplomacy explains why we still find pagan elements and trappings associated with him. Let's take the Arch of Constantine in Rome again, for example. There are good reasons it includes pagan elements and has no overtly Christian ones. To begin with, very little of the decoration on the arch is original to it. As with many Roman monuments, most of its carvings were not newly created, but were recycled from earlier triumphal works raised by Trajan, Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. These elements included depictions of pagan gods and river spirits and the goddess Victoria. The elements that were created specifically for the arch, on the other hand, have no overtly Christian ones, but no pagan ones either. These consist of the frieze depicting the defeat of Maxentius 
and the arch's dedicatory inscription. The inscription is interestingly neutral on anything religious. It has no invocations of Jupiter, Mars or Sol Invictus, but hails the Emperor Caesar Flavius Constantius, the greatest pious and blessed Augustus, and says he was inspired by the divine and by the greatness of his mind to deliver the state from a tyrant. The words used here, instinctu divinitatis, can mean inspired by the divine or inspired by a divinity, but either is ambiguous and neutral on which divinity or what divine element inspired him. Again, there's nothing overtly or specifically pagan or Christian here. Both can be read into what the inscription says, and that actually seems to have been the idea. Some of Constantine's coins, on the other hand, do include overtly pagan images and inscriptions. For example, this coin, dated to about 314 and so very early in Constantine's reign, has the emperor's head on the obverse and the sun god Sol Invictus on the reverse, with the inscription Soli Invicto Comiti, or the unconquered sun, my companion. A slightly later gold coin, dated to 320, has a reverse where Sol Invictus greets Constantine while holding a globe, topped with a figure of Victoria. The inscription reads, Soli Comiti Augusti Nostri, or the sun companion of our Augustus. But it's notable that these coins generally date to early in Constantine's reign, and again, largely to the 18 years in which his rule was not yet secure, or when he was sharing power with his pagan rival Licinius. Once he became sole emperor, we begin to see Christian symbolism on his coins. Many of these feature the Cairo symbol, which uses two Greek letters to stand for the title of Christ. This one from 334 shows the Cairo between two military standards. And this one from 327 depicts it on top of a vexilla flag. And the medallion he issued very early in his reign, possibly as early as 316, is one of several that depict the emperor wearing the Cairo symbol on his helmet. This is something his Christian biographer Eusebius says was common for Constantine. So we have mixed iconography for Constantine early in his reign, but more consistently Christian symbolism on his coins later. It should also be remembered that coins are highly conservative in their iconography. For example, British coins carry the letters FD, standing for for Dei Defensor, or Defender of the Faith. This is supposed to refer to the British monarch's role as the head of the Church of England, but the title was first granted to Henry VIII by Pope Leo X in 1521 to recognise his defence of the Catholic sacraments. Henry was to break with Rome and his successors became heads of a Protestant church, but British coins still carry a reference to this Catholic title to this day. Any historian in the distant future who interpreted this as evidence that the British monarchs were secretly Catholics would be, of course, completely wrong. But it's not just political diplomacy and conservatism that accounts for the somewhat mixed evidence regarding Constantine and religion. The nature of religious practice in the fourth century also meant that while a modern person may expect a sudden and complete break with any form of paganism once someone converted to Christianity, this is not necessarily how things may have played out for someone like Constantine. The evidence could well be reflecting an evolving understanding of what he believed about Jesus, with a slower transition from a pagan worshipper of the sun gods, Sol and Apollo, to one who saw Christ and the sun god as similar, or even as the same figure, to eventually someone who came to reject other gods but still saw Christ rather like a solar deity. The Christian writers Eusebius and Lactantius give idealised versions of the emperor's conversion, with both telling stories of a vision he saw before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge and Constantine attributing this victory to Christ and thus making a sudden and complete conversion. Eusebius' version is the most dramatic. In it, Constantine notes that the emperors before him who had failed and died had worshipped many gods, so he decided to pray for guidance to the one supreme god. He was then rewarded with a vision, and Eusebius assures the reader that his account comes directly from the emperor himself, and that Constantine confirmed this statement with an oath. In Eusebius's telling, he said that about noon, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens above the sun, and bearing the inscription, 
by this conquer. At this sight, he himself was struck with amazement and his whole army also, which followed him on this expedition and witnessed the miracle. In this account, Constantine is then visited by Christ in his sleep, who commanded him to make a likeness of that sign which he had seen in the heavens and use it as a safeguard in all engagements with his enemies. So Constantine does this, ordering the making of a gold and jeweled Cairo standard, which Eusebius says he later saw. Led by this divinely ordained standard, his army won its victory the next day. But things get more complicated when we compare this with Lactantius's account. Lactantius was even more closely acquainted with the emperor, since he was the tutor of Constantine's eldest son, Crispus. His version of the story is also written quite close to the events, not decades later like Eusebius' version. In his treatise on the deaths of the various Roman persecutors of Christianity, Lactantius gives a rather different story about Constantine's conversion. In this one, we do get a dream, but no vision witnessed by the whole army. Constantine was directed by a dream to cause the heavenly sign to be delineated on the shields of his soldiers and so proceed to battle. He did as he had been commanded and he marked on their shields the letter X with a perpendicular line drawn through it and turned around thus at the top, being the cipher of Christ and having this sign, his troops stood to arms. Again, he goes on to win his victory under the Christian sign. Complicating things further, we have an anonymous panegyric, a poem of praise, dating to two years before the fateful battle, which talks about a quite different vision. According to this poem, in 310, Constantine had just won an earlier battle against Maxentius's father, Maximin. After the battle, Constantine visits the temple of Apollo in northeastern Gaul, and there he sees a vision of the god Apollo, who gives him laurel wreaths and predicts a long life and rule as an emperor. Of course, there have been many attempts to reconcile these stories, but their common elements and the fact that at least two of them are based supposedly on Constantine's own account indicate that he was, like many in the ancient world, very open to dreams and visions of the divine. He may have seen no contradiction, at least initially, to believing in both Apollo and Christ, and may even have conflated the two. It could be that his memories and interpretations of what he saw or dreams changed over time as he became more clear on Christian doctrine and his former polytheism gave way to a henotheism where he saw a solar deity version of Christ as his main god and then eventually this developed into a more orthodox monotheistic form of Christianity. What is clear is that he regarded himself as a Christian and was seen as one by his contemporaries Christian writers like Eusebius probably exaggerated his orthodoxy, but even pagan historians like Zosimus agree that he definitely converted to the new faith. Writing in the early 5th century, Zosimus condemned Constantine for abandoning the old gods and claimed his conversion was simply a way to find forgiveness for the murders of his wife and son. After being told by pagan priests that there was no way to cleanse him after such terrible crimes, Zosimus says... An Egyptian arriving from Spain and very familiar with the court ladies being at Rome happened to fall into converse with Constantine and assured him that the Christian doctrine would teach him how to cleanse himself from all his offences and that they who received it were immediately absolved from all their sins. Constantine had no sooner heard this than he easily believed what was told him and forsaking the rights of his country received those which the Egyptian offered him. If there was any hint that this conversion had not happened or had not been genuine, we would expect pagan writers like Zosimus to note this, but they don't. And Constantine's actions also indicate a genuine conversion, even if it was one that evolved in sophistication and of understanding over time. He extended religious toleration to the Christians, ending the decade of persecution. He also ordered confiscated Christian property to be returned, banned crucifixion and gladiator games, passed laws against magic and divination, promoted Christians to public office, built churches and founded a new capital in which no pagan temples were to be established, while he also sponsored and encouraged the building of churches there. Any doubt about how Christian Constantine was should be tempered by reading his Oration to the Saints. Exactly when he gave this address is not clear, but it's a speech given in defence of Christianity, which, if read aloud, 
would run to something like two hours. Given the most modern scholars consider it genuine, it makes it very clear that he had, by this stage at least, become a devout believer. And it was as a Christian believer that he called the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which brings us back to another of the claims by Rogan and Dawkins, that it was at this council Constantine created the Bible. In his rant noted earlier, Joe Rogan assures his listeners that the New Testament is utter horseshit and was created by a bishop and a Roman emperor, something that he loudly declares is a fact, an established religious fact that everyone knows. Similarly, Dawkins repeatedly claims that Constantine created the Bible and did so at the Council of Nicaea. This idea is often repeated in pop culture and forms a central claim in the 2003 novel The Da Vinci Code and its 2006 movie version. Of course, there certainly was a council held by the Emperor Constantine at his palace in Nicaea between May 20 and around June 19 in 325 AD. And at it, bishops from across the Roman Empire gathered to vote on several things, including the date of Easter, the role of church law, and a number of administrative issues. But the key purpose of the council, however, was the resolution of the Arian controversy over the status of Jesus as God the Son in relation to God the Father in the doctrine of the Trinity. The statement of the council on this matter formed the Nicene Creed, which became the basis of future Christological formulations and the subject of many, many later disputes on the matter. What the council did not vote on or even discuss was the biblical canon. In other words, which Christian books and texts could be considered divinely inspired and therefore scripture. Leading scholar Bart Ehrman is typically emphatic on the subject. The historical reality is that the Emperor Constantine had nothing to do with the formation of the canon of scripture. He did not choose which books to include or exclude, and he did not order the destruction of the gospels that were left out of the canon. The formation of the New Testament canon was a long and drawn out process that began centuries before Constantine and did not conclude until long after he was dead. As Ehrman notes, far from being determined by one council and an emperor in 325 AD, the formation of the Christian canon was one of slow development over several centuries. The whole idea of a canon of accepted and authoritative works predates Christianity and actually began with the development of the schools of Greek philosophy. As works of key philosophers circulated in the decades after their deaths, other works wrongly or falsely attributed to them also found their way into circulation. So later followers of some philosophical traditions developed rules by which they decided which works were genuine and which were pseudepigraphical forgeries. The word canon comes from the Greek kanon, meaning rule, or literally a measuring stick. By the early second century, Christianity had a similar problem, with a wide range of texts, letters and gospels in circulation, all claiming to be the authentic works of the first generation of Christians. Any given isolated Christian community may well have known of some of them, but not others. They may also have had copies of a few of them, but only heard of others, since copies of any books were expensive and precious. And they may also have used a variety of other writings, many of which did not ultimately find their way into the Christian Bible. There was no single central church which dictated these things at this early stage. Each community operated in either relative isolation or maybe intermittent communication with other Christian communities. And there was no standardised text or a set list of which texts were authoritative and which were not at this very early stage in the Christian faith. Christianity's parent faith, Judaism, had a similar plethora of religious texts from which it chose a few and considered these to be scripture and especially authoritative as the word of God. There's evidence that this idea was beginning to be applied to some of the early Christian writings as well, with references to four definitive gospels being made by Irenaeus in the mid second century and a reference to interpretation of the letters of Paul alongside the rest of the scriptures being as made as early as around 120 AD. Contrary to Rogan's claims, these Gospels were written only a few decades after Jesus' time, not centuries later. And contrary to Dawkins, they were not selected from about 50 Gospels, 
we have copies, fragments of, or references to perhaps 14 to maybe 18 other Gospels, most of which were quite late works, not 50. It seems here, though, that the heresy of Marcion was what gave second century Christianity the impetus to begin to define which of these various texts had the status of scripture and which did not. Marcion was born around 100 AD in the city of Sinope on the southern coast of the Black Sea. After falling out with his father, the local bishop, he traveled to Rome in around 139 AD, where he began to develop his own Christian theology, one which was quite different to that of his father and of the Christian community in Rome. Marcion was struck by the strong distinction made by Paul between the law of the Jews and the gospel of Christ. For Marcion, this distinction was absolute. The coming of Jesus made the whole of the Jewish law and Jewish scriptures redundant, and the God of the Jews was actually quite different to the God preached by Jesus. For Marcion, the Jewish God was evil, vengeful, violent and judgmental, while the God of Jesus was quite the opposite. Marcion decided that there were actually two gods, the evil one who had misled the Jews and the good one who had been revealed by Jesus. This understanding led Marcion to put together a canon of Christian scripture, the first of its kind, which excluded all of the Jewish scriptures that make up the Old Testament and which included 10 of the epistles of Paul and only one of the gospels, the gospel of Luke. Marcion tried to get his radical reassessment of Christianity and his canon accepted by calling a council of the Christian community in Rome. Far from accepting his teachings, the council excommunicated him and he left Rome in disgust, returning to Asia Minor. There he met with far more success though, and Marcionite churches sprang up, which embraced his idea of two gods and used his canon of 11 scriptural works. Alarmed at his success, other Christian leaders began to preach and write vigorously against Marcion's ideas, and it seems that his canon of 11 works inspired anti-Marcionite Christians to begin to define which texts were and were not scriptural according to them. As mentioned earlier, it was Irenaeus who made the first known defence of the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as the oldest and only scriptural ones, and he did so at least partially on the grounds that these four had always been regarded as the earliest and most authoritative. Interestingly, after two centuries of sceptical analysis, the overwhelming majority of historians, scholars and other textual experts today, Christian or otherwise, actually agree with Irenaeus, and the consensus is that these four Gospels most certainly are the earliest accounts of Jesus' life. Not long after Irenaeus' defence of the four canonical Gospels, we get our first evidence of a detailed list of which texts are scriptural. A manuscript called the Muratorian Canon dates to sometime in the late 2nd century AD and was discovered in a library in Milan in the 18th century. It details that the canonical four Gospels, along with most of the other books found in the modern New Testament, as well as a couple that are not, are scriptural and authoritative. It also gives some approval to other more recent works like The Shepherd of Hermas, but says that they should not be read in church as scripture. The Muratorian canon document accepts 23 of the 27 works which now make up the New Testament in the Bible. It also explicitly rejects several books on the grounds that they are recent and written by fringe heretical groups, and it specifically singles out the work by the Gnostic leader Valentius and by Marcion and his followers. So it seems that the challenge posed by Marcion and other dissident groups caused the early Christians to determine which books were scriptural and which were not. And it also seems that recent works, whether they were heretical, like the Gnostic Gospels, or not, like the Shepherd of Hermas, did not have the status of works from the earliest years of Christianity. It was only these earliest works which were considered authoritative. It's clear, therefore, that the process of deciding which texts were canonical and which were not was already well underway a century before Constantine was even born. It also continued for a long time after he died. Constantine's contemporary, the historian Eusebius, set out to summarise the writings of the New Testament in his Ecclesiastical History, a work written towards the end of Constantine's reign. He lists the works which are generally acknowledged, including the four canonical Gospels, Acts, the Epistles of Paul, 1 John, 1 Peter, and the Apocalypse of John, though he says this last text is still disputed by some. He gives some other texts which are still disputed, including James, Jude, 2 Peter, and 2 and 3 John. 
He gives other books which are probably spurious, and then he lists still others which are definitely considered heretical, including the Gospels of Peter, Thomas and Matthias, and the Acts of Andrew and John. So not only did the process of deciding the canon begin long before Constantine, there was still debate within the church about the canon in his time. And it continued. In 367, Athanasius wrote his 39th festal letter, in which he laid out the current 27 books of the New Testament, the first time this canon had been definitively stated by any churchman. A synod convened in Rome by Pope Damasus in 382 AD also considered the question of the canon and, with the help of the great multilingual scholar Jerome, settled on the same 27 books set out by Athanasius. At this stage, there was still no central authority which could compel church communities in any way but local councils and synods in Hippo and Carthage in North Africa and later ones in Gaul also settled on the same canon. These local definitions mean that there was actually no definitive statement by the Catholic Church as to the makeup of the New Testament until the Council of Trent in 1546. That's a full 1,209 years after Constantine died. The full development of the canon took several centuries, though the basics of which Gospels were to be included was settled by about 200 AD at least. All this shows that what Rogan and Dawkins assert so emphatically is completely wrong. So what Rogan and Dawkins claim is total garbage, but if that's so, where did the myth come from? It seems that it can be traced to a quip made by Voltaire in reference to a miracle story of no historical value. Francois-Marie Arouet, better known by his nom de plume Voltaire, is still justly famous for his wit, his erudition, and for his attacks on the established position of the Catholic Church in the France of his day, and his advocacy of freedom of religion and the separation of church and state. He made several mentions of the idea that the biblical canon was decided at the Council of Nicaea in his Dictionnaire Philosophique of 1764, noting with amusement the rather silly way the council supposedly chose the relevant books. It is reported in the supplement of the Council of Nicaea that the fathers, when they had no idea how to determine which were questionable or apocryphal books of the Old and New Testament, piled all of them disorderly on an altar and the books to be rejected fell to the ground. It's a pity this nice method has fallen into disuse nowadays. None of the accounts of the Council from the time give so much as a hint about any such event, so Voltaire was clearly working from much later sources. Some online detective work by Roger Pierce and others has untangled the story of this anecdote, and it appears Voltaire was working from an appendix to the Jesuit scholar Philippe Labbé's Sanctissima Concilia of 1671, which is the supplement mentioned in the quote earlier. But the ultimate source seems to have been an anonymous medieval Byzantine work, the Vetus Synodicon, which gave an account of the major councils and synods of the church up to about 87 AD. This work became available in Western Europe in the early 17th century, and so seems to be where the whole story came from and the Synodicon account of Nicaea concludes the, the canonical and apocryphal works it distinguished in the following manner. In the house of God, the books were placed down by the holy altar, and then the council asked the Lord in prayer that the inspired works be found on top, and, as in fact happened, the spurious on the bottom. This 9th century miracle story is only found in this one work and is not referenced in any earlier material on the council of Nicaea so it appears to have found its way via its publication by the Lutheran theologian Johannes Pappus into Philip Labbé's appendix and thus to Voltaire. And thanks to the popularity of Voltaire's works across Europe, his wry little joke about the miraculous selection of books at Nicaea has taken on the status of historical fact and given rise to the whole myth. So what we see here is both Rogan and Dawkins have simply parroted a false factoid that appealed to them without bothering with the simplest fact checking. After all, a quick Google and skim read of the Wikipedia entry on the Council of Nicaea would have indicated that they should at the very least 
have stopped to do a bit more research, but neither bothered to do even this. Rogan, I suppose, has the excuse that he's not exactly an intellectual and is basically a musclehead who shouts into a microphone for a living. But Peter Boghossian is supposed to be an educated man, yet he smugly praises Rogan's proclamations. Similarly, Dawkins is billed as one of the great thinkers of our time, and the late Christopher Hitchens is also held up as a beacon of rationalism. Yet none of these supposed rationalists can be trusted on these key points of history. The claim that Constantine's conversion was politically motivated doesn't make any sense, yet Hitchens declares it as a fact. The claim that Constantine was not actually a Christian is contrary to a mass of evidence, yet Rogan shouts it as though it is history, while Boghossian nods approvingly. The idea that Constantine created the Bible is a complete myth, yet Dawkins states it repeatedly in a book aimed at getting teenagers to base their ideas on facts, not appealing stories. When prominent atheist thinkers and spokesmen spout nonsense at the same level as Joe Rogan and the Da Vinci Code, it's clear that atheist activism has a genuine problem when it comes to getting history right. These people need to do much, much better. See you again here soon.